This is the new TC Pride Podcast, episode 36, on location coverage of the 2016 Transgender Day of Remembrance. TC Pride Podcast, we are on location at the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance. I am here with... Rachel Keefe. I am the pastor of Living Table United Church of Christ. And can you just share some of your thoughts on the event tonight? I think that Trans Day of Remembrance, though it's unfortunate that we need to have one, it is a great opportunity to bring a community that has been marginalized and often brutalized together in a safe place for them to mourn, to remember, and to build strength to face the ever-growing fear for themselves. The word bittersweet was used uh, a few times, right? Yeah, bittersweet indeed, because there there's power here. There's power in coming together to mourn and to remember and, and to take comfort in one another and to remind folks who often feel very alone that they're not alone. And it was also talked about tonight about how the world has changed uh, a lot in the last um, you know couple of weeks, I guess. Um, as as the pastor of this of this community, what are some of the fears that that, that you've been you know hearing or, or sensing within this community? There's a, a lot of fear here. We have a lot of folks who identify as part of the queer community, and they are afraid that the rights that they have gained and the safety that have ga- they have gained in recent years is going to evaporate. Um, I even heard somebody say it's going to become illegal to be who I am. That's a pretty scary thing. And uh, there was a lot of talk tonight about how uh, not only are we remembering the transgender people that we've lost, but it's, we're also here to talk about what next and, and where do we go from here. Um, wh- what is your sense for uh, what both individuals within the transgender community and other uh, individuals, maybe allies or other people in the community can do to, uh, to help going forward? Uh, someone said it, you know, reach out to someone who's trans and check in with them and remind them they're not alone, that they have value, that they are loved. Because ultimately, it's the love we share for one another and can show one another that's going to overcome the fear that is pervasive in our society right now. Uh, Paula Overby. Well, I think uh, visibility is certainly an important, uh, as I said when I spoke this evening, uh, we change the world every day just by going out into it. And I think that that's essentially what it's all about. Uh, we need to hold these events. We need to be visible. Uh, I think it's helpful that more and more people are identifying as trans rather than trying to conceal themselves within the opposite gender. Uh, it, that's what gives people a, a comfort level with who we are. And we're people just like everyone else. Uh, aside from that one little peculiarity perhaps, uh, you know, we're Democrats, we're Republicans, we're artists, we're engineers, uh, just like the rest of the population. Quinn Via Gomez. Um, kind of what I heard tonight was, you know, being able to walk down the street alone. You know, those are some issues that we're still facing. Fears of what's going to happen to the trans community, especially the next four years with the new president-elect of of Trump. You know, there's just a lot of things that our community has to fear, things that he might overpower or new bills that he might come up with and we're not safe. You know, there's a lot of issues that are facing our community, such as bullying and murder, and those are still things that we fear today, especially with myself. You know, I fear walking down the street. I fear going into public places. So I think those are a lot of things that we have to face right now. Yes, um, I think tonight's event was important for the transgender community, especially for myself as a trans woman, um, a Latina trans woman. Um, I think that I needed to be here in support of all my trans brothers and sisters because there are so many of us in our community that are being murdered based on our gender and more than our our knowledge and our wealth and also a high rate of of trans women and men of color specifically african-american and latina so that's kind of something that's a really big issue and it just was really important for me to be here and and to be in support of the trans community because we're losing so many and there's just a lot of issues in the community that we're facing with transgender issues and transgender rights miju I think it's really important that we have it because it provides awareness that we otherwise wouldn't have. And I also feel it allows the community to 
to come together because there's already so much friction between people inside of the community itself. But, but this event allows people to just come together and be and mourn and to be and to be together for once. I would say the rights being taken away of those who are trans, not being able to use the right bathrooms, not getting the right medication, being more harassed than usual now because of the, of the presidency and just a general slew of other things that make it impossible for them to be who they are. Because under Obama, it was much easier, but under Trump now, it might be a lot harder, I feel. For one is to not lose hope because if we don't have any hope, we can't make a better future. To band together and to just continue to stand up for our rights and fight about it. Because if we can't do that, then, we, then we're losing. We just have lost the battle. <laughs> I'm Faith Bryan and uh, I live in St. Paul. Well, I, I spoke a little bit about how much this event always seems to hit home with me. Um, I don't know any of these girls, yet I always seem to end up in tears. And then tonight, the second name that they read was a young trans woman from my hometown of Bakersfield, California. And it, it took me almost the whole list to get my breath back. It just took my breath away. Um, it is so tragic, the number of young women and young men that we lose every year to ignorance is what it really comes down to. Um, and, and this is an opportunity for us as a community to come together and remember, but also to kind of come together and get to know each other because so many of us are segmented and as Barbara said, fragmented and hidden. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to get to know each other and share our transness, share our grief, uh, share our community. Well, I think our biggest fear right now is that many of our uh, advances were issued as executive orders. And uh, our president-elect has vowed to, uh, within the first 24 to 48 hours, cancel everything that was done by President Obama. And, and a lot of that was uh, particularly in the, in the vein of transgender protections, uh, bathroom protections particularly. Um, I know a lot of my sisters uh, face a real issue when it comes to that, I don't because I have legally changed my gender uh, and my name. So uh, they want to see my ID. Uh, I'll show them my ID. That's all they're going to see. <laughs> but uh, that, and I think the uh, just the the general um, the general atmosphere of intolerance. I think we had really built a wonderfully tolerant society under President Obama, and I think we're all afraid that that's going to go away. And it will go away if we let it. We need to fight to maintain it, and I think it's something that we certainly can can uh, can keep. We will we we will backtrack, as Barbara said. We will have to regain some of the ground, refight for it, and 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 rewin it. But um, I'm very hopeful that this will be not a uh, end for our community, but a beginning and a, and a really, like I said, a battle cry for us to come together. Hi, I'm Barbara Satin, and I've been the coordinator of the Transgender Day of Remembrance in Minneapolis, St. Paul, for the past 18 years. Now, something that folks may not know about you as well is we were at the Outfront Gala uh, just a few days ago. You were actually honored this year. Can you uh, maybe tell folks a little bit about the honor you received at the Outfront Gala this year? I received uh, Outfront's Legacy Award, which was humbling. Um, but also perplexing because it's sort of like the Gene Herschel Award at the Oscars. Um, I almost felt like I should be dead or something. It, um, it's sort of at something you get at the end of your career. And I, you know, I'm 82 years old, but I'm far from finished with what I'm doing. So um, I hope they give me a second one. <laughs> Awesome, me too. They, uh, I saw you posted something on Facebook is that, that you said the Legacy Award sort of implies that, that the work is finished or something, right? But, but you said, uh, no, I'm just getting started, right? And there's more work to be done now than there was even a week ago. So, so, so for people who aren't familiar with, with this event, can you just kind of maybe just talk a little bit about the background of the event and maybe how it began and, and uh, how it became what it is today? It started actually uh, with the murder of Rita Hester in Boston, Massachusetts, um, basically 19 years ago. And uh, Rita's death stirred people in San Francisco, surprisingly, that said, we need to do something about the violence against the trans community. And so they formed the first 
Transgender Day of Remembrance uh, without any large expectations of what it was going to be. And it's turned into this international event that takes place across the world. Um, 200 to 250 cities in uh, 30 countries around the world. Um, and this is the 18th year that we've held it uh, here in Minnesota. And I've been involved with it from the very beginning and I've watched it grow from a small gathering of 25 people who were just scratching their heads trying to figure out what, what this is all about to now a church full of allies and trans and gender nonconforming folk who just want to be together to gather strength from their sadness, but also to mourn and honor the people who've been killed. Clearly the world has changed in the last couple of weeks. Um, you spoke in, in your remarks about how uh, you woke up on Tuesday morning with a lot of optimism, and then on Wednesday morning you were filled with uh, a lot of disappointment, but you said also fear. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people recently, and, and there is a strong sense of fear uh, within the community. Um, what are some specific fears that, uh, that, that you think there are um, in the community right now? Well, particularly within the trans community, there's always been this fear of uh, being outed in ways that uh, will jeopardize either our work or our family. You know, we have some protections in Minnesota under the human rights protection. Uh, we've had that for a generation. It's protected us around certain issues, but it hasn't kept us from um, harassment and from insults. And the, unfortunately, the political rhetoric over the last year and a half of the campaigning, the call and response to bigotry and um, transphobia, homophobia, has now played out in a way that uh, people who were responding to that are feeling entitled to act out rather than just speak out. And uh, so we're seeing within the first week after the election, the trans uh, suicide line uh, had a 40% had a increase in their caseload. Um, the Southern Law Poverty Law Center uh, has had four ca 400 cases of uh, harassment that they have identified and responded to. Um, the Trevor Project, which is a suicide prevention, um, has also seen a significant spike in calls from people who are so frightened that they don't know whether they should even stay around. So it's some of us are at a place in our lives where we're very comfortable with who we are, and so the fear isn't quite as fragile for us, but uh, there are a lot of particularly younger uh, trans people who are just coming out, who came out with trepidation and now are coming, you know, thinking that they were coming out in, a, in an environment that was growing to be more welcoming. And now they're finding that they're coming out into an environment that's threatening to them. And with any community that's, that, that's under attack or threatened or marginalized in any way, part of fighting for, for, for their rights is knowing what their rights are. You mentioned the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Um, what, for people that aren't familiar, what, what are some of the rights that, that you said have been afforded um, to like the transgender community for, for some time through that act? Primarily, there are rights that everybody has in protecting uh, Minnesota, surprisingly, in 1993, was the first state to pass a human rights protection that included the transgender community. Human rights for GLB people, gay, lesbian, and bisexual, was pretty common in the states that pass those laws. Uh, it protects people against uh, discrimination on housing and employment, um, in public accommodations, things that you know we just uh, never expected in the trans community would ever be something that we could you know comfortably go into any restaurant or bar, hotel, public theater, and not feel threatened. And what's been fascinating about the Minnesota law is we've had it for 23 years, and there have been no downsides to it from the GLBT community. Minnesota is a unique state, and we hope that we can keep it unique. Um, it turned a little purple in this last election, and uh, but the protections that are in place, um, most of the younger trans and GLB community have lived under those protections for most of their lives. So th their expectations have always been sort of, I'm going to be accepted, and now it's sort of like, okay, uh, are we 
under threat. And you would also say that that, that was actually one of the moments um, within the, the GLBT history, I guess, within the Twin Cities, that was actually a strong moment of solidarity. You said that, I, if I recall, you said that there were some prominent lesbians within the community that wouldn't sign the bill unless it included transgender uh, rights, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah, it was, as I pointed out to people, it wasn't the law didn't include trans protection because the trans community wanted it and was prepared and active to make it happen. Uh, we still weren't that politically active, uh, but it was the GLB community and uh, out front Minnesota that was willing to take the risk. And the lesbian community really stepped forward and said, you know, this has got to happen. They said it directly to the author of the bill. Uh, we we won't accept the bill unless it includes everybody. And he was reluctant at first, but then, you know, when it passed, he was just so pleased that it, would, that it happened. You had also talked about tonight about how, you know, part of the, the, the purpose of tonight was to remember those within the transgender community that we've lost, but it's also to talk about where do we go from here? And you know what? What do we do with um, with with the sadness and the fear that that that's felt going forward? So, um, where do we go from here? What what what's next? Well, I think what came out of the conversation tonight are the things that I was hoping would come out, and that is people were able to express their their fear, their anger, their frustration, and that's good. It's it's important rather than be tied up, uh, isolated in your apartment and have nobody to to uh, vent around. But the important part of tonight was, and what do you do next? And for the most part, people were saying, we've got to take action, we've got to get involved, we've got to connect with other people and tell our stories. Uh, and I think that's a significant challenge to the trans community because many in the trans community still are relatively isolated and shy about being out because they're not sure how they're going to be accepted, um, but yet people have to hear their stories to understand who they really are, these wonderful, wonderful people. And then what about allies? What, what can cisgender allies do to, um, to help support um, any of the causes that, that transgender people are fighting for right now? Well, the most important thing is to reach out to trans people um, that you may know in your workplace or they may know in your church setting or you may know just in social environments. Um, let them know that you're an ally. Um, there is a meme that's going around that's the safety pin that people are wearing to sort of sh try to show that this is a safe place. Um, people need to know that um, so that they can f know somebody that they can feel free to talk to, um, express their concerns, express their fears, their hopes, whatever it might be. So the allied community, I think, has a role to play in uh, being supportive. I also suggested to people that if you know somebody who is trans, um, call them, say hello to them, say how are you doing, ask them how they're doing, because so many of them are basically isolated. And you know, it's one thing to be fearful in a community, it's another thing to be fearful all alone. It just exacerbates the fear uh, and the loneliness and the depression that comes. So a phone call from somebody saying, I was thinking about you. How are things going in your life? Is there anything I can do? Would you like to have coffee? Just a simple phone call would be so helpful for people. And then are there any other projects or events that you're involved with right now that you'd like to share with people? Right at the moment, I'm heading to um, Orlando, Florida uh, where a group of faith leaders are gathering um, to do some planning for their own organization, but also to stand in solidarity uh, with the faith communities in uh, uh, Orlando uh, at the Pulse nightclub uh, setting. Locally, today is basically the Transgender Day of Re Remembrance, but it's also the Transgender Day of Resilience. And we need more uh, emphasis, I think, on the resiliency of the uh, trans community. And in the spring, we will have a Transgender Day of Visibility, which will be designed to be a sort of counterweight to the sadness of the Day of Remembrance to actually the pride and glory of being trans. Thank you so much for your time, Barbara. I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. The TC Pride Podcast has been a production of Podletter Media and Twin Cities Pride. Subscribe now on iTunes or Google Play and submit your first Pride story at 
myfirstprize.org.